My mother's father was born in 1896, born the year of Plessy. So it's his family that grew up on the plantation. He said, I never thought that the system of segregation would change. I never heard the word slave until I was 50 years old. I don't know whether it was shame or pain or both. My great-grandfather was born a slave. When he was 28, he was freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. In 1954, I was teaching in Newton, Massachusetts. Martin Luther King was my friend. We went north to school. But when the Supreme Court decision came down, Brown versus Board of Education, change was going to come. And all of us, to the woman, to the man, we wanted to be a part of that change. So I went in to Loyola University. We don't accept Negroes. I said, well, the Supreme Court just passed a decision. He said, yes, but it is still a state law. My mother being a school teacher, my father being a civil rights lawyer, uh, were very much in the front of the fight, willing to sacrifice so that we would have it better. And we meaning not only the five of us, but I think children of our generation. Those of us who go back that far knew of white and colored water fountains, and it was a black New Orleans and a white New Orleans, and never should the twain meet. At Sears Roebuck, she says, we will not use these bathrooms in this store. We have to go to the bathroom. Like, this is an emergency. So they were going into the men and the women. I said, no, you have to come over here. They didn't say anything, but I know it registered with them. Since they were fighting for an open society, and they wanted their kids to be part of that open society, we went to schools the second year that they were integrated. By the time I was first or second grade, I'd probably been called the N-word a hundred times. And they were always mean children, and they were always nice children. From the time Mark was a little boy, he followed his father everywhere. And so in those days, campaigning was on the back of a truck with a bullhorn and a band. It was going to churches. It was going to community meetings, doing something that your friends were not doing. I came home, I said, Mom, I said, that campaigning is fun. Dutch was the first African-American member of the legislature. Dutch was the first appellate court judge. Dutch was the first assistant U.S. attorney. I got a chance to work in this very historic campaign a long shot campaign, but turned into a movement. Because I was running a lawn sign crew, I got an opportunity to literally go through all the neighborhoods of the city. My father did the impossible because at the time, the city's voters were still majority white. It was overwhelming. I mean, it was, nobody could believe it. You know, this was, the first black mayor, history making. When Mark was elected mayor, he was 36 years old. He was one of the youngest mayors in the city, even in the country. At that point, New Orleans was one of the leading cities in terms of violent street crime. I mean, we had uh, 458 murders in one year. I'm in the title insurance business. I was being notified by the top life companies that they were not going to refinance. They wanted out. We had a murder in the Magnolia housing complex. They had police everywhere. Ma got out of the car. The mom was out there. Even when he walked over to her just to console her, and this girl was just breaking down and crying, I think it broke him a little bit. This battle was a fight for the soul of the city. Nine-year-old James Darby was murdered in a drive-by shooting in front of his mom and little sister. Gus was considered one of the most dangerous properties in the city of New Orleans. We had, in one month, nine murders. My cousin, Rayleigh, had been brutally gunned down by a robber in front of his house. You had brutality, record rates of murder, and you had a department that was corrupt. When Mark took office and he inherited that department, it was being investigated. We had FBI agents conducting sting operations. And I could not fix New Orleans without fixing the police department. The mayor, in a 2.30 a.m. meeting, sealed the deal with Richard Pennington to become New Orleans police chief. He had been the district commander in Anacostia. 
We believe that one of the essential parts of crime fighting in this community is to get people and neighborhood organizations actively involved in the fight against crime. Poor neighborhoods don't have neighborhood homeowners associations. They've, we've got churches. A phone company donated 100 cell phones to put citizens on patrol armed with phones to call the cops when they spot crime. And he got the business community at the table. He got the neighborhood folks at the table. But everybody had to work for this. You got to check your guns at the door. When you're in here working to try and make this city better, we're all going to be one. We all approached it from different reasons. My involvement was personal. I just wanted the city to be safe for my children. I called a special meeting of the city council, and I laid a plan on them that shifted 200 police officers from desk jobs to patrol duties and responsibilities. 26 more cops moved out from behind the desks and onto the street here in the 5th District. It's a big step to fighting crime, one the neighbors here are already noticing. I shifted money around to create the largest youth jobs program and recreation department program in the city's history. They say if they can keep kids off the streets, they won't be suspects, they won't be victims, and they won't be statistics. Mayor Mark Morial said it before, there's a new sheriff in town. Spiritually rebuilding the city, rebuilding our belief in our community, in our organizations, and in our ability to change the quality of life for the better. The third component of the plan was a dusk to dawn curfew. The crime rate went down. It dropped 62% during Mark's administration. I tell you, Gus went from a complex with nine murders a month to zero. All of a sudden, police started feeling better about themselves. The public was waving at the police. The cops, they were shining their badges. They wanted to wear a uniform. They didn't want to be in an unmarked car. What a turnaround. If you had said in 1994 that the NBA was going to relocate to New Orleans, people would have said, man, you crazy. With all this crime, with all of the problems we had, don't even think about doing that. After 9-11 occurred, Paul Tagliabue, who was the commissioner of the NFL at that time, he had tremendous pressure to relocate the Super Bowl to New York City. Mayors from across the country crowd Washington to talk about homeland security. Mayor Mark Morial is the president of the Conference of Mayors. Already there are plans to put the National Guard, state police, and FBI on patrol, restrict the airspace over the city, and guard it with military jets. We wanted to keep the game and keep the game we did. The administration that involved everybody, black and white and brown. Mark brought us to a place where we had never been, including Hispanics and everything he did. He created this idea about the Gumbo Coalition. If you're from New Orleans, you know what Gumbo is. I mean, there's a little bit of everything, right? Gumbo has rice and it has sausage and maybe seafood and maybe onions, and it starts with a roux. And that was a blending of all of what made New Orleans what New Orleans is, a city that was worthy of being saved. Cities define America. Cities are also the laboratories for the future of America. What America is becoming, a multicultural democracy, is what cities have always been. And I saw the Urban League as a chance to continue to advocate on behalf of people who were locked out and left out. What defines the American dream? Owning a home. Earn enough money to take care of your needs. Take care of the needs of the people you love. I think in the history of the Civil Rights Movement, it was implicit. The Essence Festival is the largest African-American cultural gathering in the country. With Mark and our partnership with the National Urban League, there's career development, there's supportive entrepreneurs. We may have 40, 50,000 people a night for the concerts, but we have over 100,000 a day in the convention center. This is a celebration of all of you, that black women have power in America. Every American fully participating in the American dream is the most important work that the Urban League does. We see everything we do in the corporate diversity space as leading to that. He's made economic empowerment one of the great symbols 
of the Urban League movement. Today, with immigrant populations that are coming in, the Urban League has all the components needed where the rubber meets the road in terms of helping people who need help. While he was still mayor, Mark came to Los Angeles, the Rodney King meeting. That just awakened people here in Ferguson, Baltimore, North Charleston, South Carolina, the list goes on and on. We had the Tamir Rice case in the city of Cleveland, and so the first person I called was Mark, because he understood from the work he'd done in policing in New Orleans and the stuff that was happening all around the country, he knew that as an Urban League leader that I was gonna have to be prepared. Now from across the nation, activists and activists converged up on Ferguson, bringing the eyes and ears of America to focus on a violent injustice. And when the marchers and the protesters had moved on, it was the Urban League who went to work. That is what a 21st century civil rights movement is all about. In the movement that my parents were involved in, in the 1960s, it wasn't just a black movement. And the Urban League movement stands for let's work together. The work that has gone on in Ferguson, Missouri to deal with divisiveness and polarization is now brick and mortar. You can see it in the building. You can see it in the people who now govern. No matter how difficult it is, as we say, we've seen this movie before. Uh, we've, we've overcome barriers higher. We've traversed valleys that are deeper. We've swam across oceans that were wider than the current situation that we face. And so if there's hope in the community, it's because hope is in our DNA.